This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corey Samuel. Paradise Lost by John Milton. Book Two, Part Two. The Stygian Council thus dissolved, and forth in order came the grand infernal peers. Midst came their mighty paramount, and seemed alone the antagonist of heaven, nor less than hell's dread emperor with pomp supreme, and godlike imitated state, him round a globe of fiery seraphim enclosed with bright emblazonry and horrent arms. Then of their session ended they bid cry with trumpets regal sound the great result. Toward the four winds, for speedy cherubim, put to their mouths the sounding alchemy, by Harold's voice explained, the hollow abyss heard far and wide, and all the host of hell with deafening shout returned them loud acclaim. Thence, more at ease, their minds and somewhat raised by false presumptuous hope, the ranged powers disband, and wandering each his several way pursues, as inclination or sad choice leads him perplexed where he may likeliest find truce to his restless thoughts, and entertain the irksome hours, till his great chief return. Part upon the plain, or in the air sublime upon the wing, or in swift race contend, as at the Olympian games or Pythian fields. Part curb their fiery steeds, or shun the goal with rapid wheels, or fronted brigades form, as when to worn proud cities war appears waged in the troubled sky and armies rush to battle in the clouds, before each van prick forth the airy knights, and couch their spears, till thickest legions close, with feats of arms from either end of heaven the welkin burns. Others, with vast Typhian rage, more fell rend up both rocks and hills, and ride the air in whirlwind, hell scarce holds the wild uproar, as when Alcides from Oelia crowned with conquest, felt the envenomed robe, and tore through pain up by the roots Thalassian pines, and Lichus from the top of Oeta threw into the Euboic Sea. Others, more mild, retreated in a silent valley, sing with notes angelical to many a harp their own heroic deeds and hapless fall by doom of battle, and complain that fate, free virtue, should enthrall to force or chance. Their song was partial, but the harmony, what could it less, when spirits immortal sing, suspended hell, and took with ravishment the thronging audience? In discourse more sweet, for eloquence the soul, song charms the sense, others apart sat on a hill retired, in thoughts more elevate, and reasoned high of providence, foreknowledge, will, and fate, fixed fate, free will, foreknowledge absolute, and found no end in wandering mazes lost, of good and evil much they argued then, of happiness and final misery, passion and apathy, and glory and shame, vain wisdom all, and false philosophy. Yet, with a pleasing sorcery, could charm pain for a while, or anguish, and excite fallacious hope, or arm the abjured breast with stubborn patience as with triple steel. Another part, in squadrons and gross bands, on bold adventure to discover wide that dismal world, if any climb perhaps might yield them easier habitation, bend four ways their flying march, along the banks of four infernal rivers that disgorge into the burning lake their baleful streams, aboard Styx, the flood of deadly hate, sad Acheron of sorrow, black and deep, Coxitus, named of lamentation loud heard on the rueful stream, fierce Phlegeton, whose waves of torrent fire in flame with rage. Far off from these a slow and silent stream, Leith, the river of oblivion, rules her watery labyrinth, whereof who drinks, forthwith his former state and being forgets, forgets both joy and grief, pleasure and pain. Beyond this flood a frozen continent lies dark and wild, beat with perpetual storms of whirlwind and dire hail, which on firm land thaws not, but gathers heap, and ruin seems of ancient pile, all else deep snow and ice, a gulf profound as that Sabonian bog betwixt Damiata and Mount Cassius old, where armies whole have sunk, 
The parching air burns fraw, And cold performs the fect of fire. Thither, by harpy-footed furies hailed, At certain revolutions all the damned are brought, And feel by turns the bitter change of fierce extremes, Extremes by change more fierce, From beds of raging fire, To starve in ice their soft ethereal warmth, And there to pine immovable, Infixed and frozen round, Periods of time, Thence hurried back to fire, they ferry over this Lethian sound, both to and fro, their sorrow to augment, and wish and struggle as they pass, to reach the tempting stream, with one small drop to lose in sweet forgetfulness all pain and woe, all in one moment, and so near the brink, but fate withstands, and to oppose the tempt Medusa with Gorgonian terror guards the ford, and of itself the water flies, all taste of living white, as once it fled the lip of Tantalus. Thus roving on, in confused march forlorn, the adventurous bands, with shuddering horror pale, and eyes aghast, viewed first their lamentable lot, and found no rest. Through many a dark and dreary vale they passed, and many a region dolorous, o'er oh, many a frozen, many a fiery alp, rocks, caves, lakes, fens, bogs, dens, and shades of death, a universe of death, which God by curse created evil, for evil only good, where all life dies, death lives, and nature breeds perverse, all monstrous, all prodigious things, abominable, unutterable, and worse than fables yet have feigned or fear conceived, gorgons and hydras, and chimeras dire. Meanwhile, the adversary of God and man, Satan, with thoughts inflamed of highest design, puts on swift wings, and toward the gates of hell explores his solitary flight. Sometimes he scours the right-hand coast, sometimes the left, now shaves with a level wing the deep, then soars up to the fiery concave touring high, as when far off at sea a fleet descried hangs in the clouds, by equinoctial winds close sailing from Bengala, or the isles of Ternate and Tidor, whence merchants bring their spicy drugs. They on the trading flood through the wide Ethiopian to the Cape, ply stemming nightly toward the pole. So seemed far off the flying fiend, at last appear hell-bounds, high-reaching to the horrid roof, and thrice threefold the gates. Three folds were brass, three iron, three of adamantine rock, impenetrable, impaled with circling fire, yet unconsumed. Before the gates there sat on either side a formidable shape, the one seemed woman to the waist, and fair, but ended foul in many a scaly fold, voluminous and vast, a serpent armed with mortal sting. About her middle round a cry of hell-hounds never ceased barking, with wide cerberan mouths full loud, and rung a hideous peal. Yet, when they list, would creep, if out disturbed their noise, into her womb, and kennel there, yet there still barked and howled within unseen. Far less abhorred than these vexed Skyla bathing in the sea that parts Calabria from the hoarse Trinacrian shore. Nor uglier follow the night hag, when called in secret, riding through the air she comes, lured with the smell of infant blood, to dance with Lapland witches, while the labouring moon eclipses at their charms. The other shape, if shape it might be called that shape had none, distinguishable in member, joint, or limb, or substance, might be called that shadow seemed for each seemed either. Black it stood as night, fierce as ten furies, terrible as hell, and shook a dreadful dart. What seemed on his head the likeness of a kingly crown had on. Satan was now at hand, and from his seat the monster moving onward came as fast, with horrid strides, hell trembled as he strode. The undaunted fiend what this might be admired, admired not feared, God and his son except, created thing naught valued he, nor shunned. And with disdainful look thus first began. Whence, and what art thou, execrable shape, that darest through grim and terrible advance thy miscreated front athwart my way to yonder gates? Through them I mean to pass, that be assured, without leave asked of thee. Retire, or taste thy folly, and learn by proof, hell-born, not to contend with spirits of heaven. 
to whom the goblin full of wrath replied, Art thou that traitor angel, art thou he, who first broke peace in heaven and faith, till then unbroken, and in proud rebellious arms drew after him the third part of heaven's sons, conjured against the highest, for which both thou and they, outcast from God, are here condemned to waste eternal days in woe and pain? And reckonst thou thyself with spirits of heaven, hell-doomed, and breathest defiance here in scorn where I reign king, and to enrage thee more, thy king and lord? Back to thy punishment, false fugitive, and to thy speed add wings, lest with a whip of scorpions I pursue thy lingering, or with one stroke of this dart strange horror seize thee, and pangs unfelt before. So spake the grisly terror and in shape so speaking, and so threatening, grew tenfold more dreadful and deform. On the other side, incensed with indignation, Satan stood unterrified, and like a comet burned, that fires the length of Ophiuchus, huge in the arctic sky, and from his horrid hair shakes pestilence and war. Each at the head levelled his deadly aim, their fatal hands no second stroke intend, and such a frown each cast at the other, as when two black clouds with heaven's artillery fraught come rattling on over the Caspian, then stand front to front hovering a space, till winds the signal blow to join their dark encounter in mid-air. So frowned the mighty combatants, that hell grew darker at their frown, so matched they stood. For never but once more was either like to meet so great a foe, and now great deeds had been achieved, whereof all hell had rung, had not the snaky sorceress that sat fast by hell-gate, and kept the fatal key, risen, and with hideous outcry rushed between. "'O father, what intends thy hand?' she cried, "'against thy only son. What fury, O son, possesses thee to bend that mortal dart against thy father's head? And knowest for whom, for him who sits above and laughs the while at thee, ordains his drudge, to execute whate'er his wrath, which he calls justice, bids his wrath which one day will destroy ye both. She spake, and at her words the hellish pest forbore, then these to her Satan returned. So strange thy outcry, and thy words so strange thou interposest, that by my sudden hand prevented spares to tell thee yet by deeds what it intends, till first I know of thee, what thing thou art, thus double-formed, and why in this internal veil first met thou callest me father, and that phantasm callest my son. I know thee not, nor ever saw, till now, sight more detestable than him and thee." To whom thus the portress of Hellgate replied, "'Hast thou forgot me, then, and do I seem now in thine eye so foul, once deemed so fair in heaven? when at the assembly and in sight of all the seraphim with thee combined in bold conspiracy against heaven's king, all on a sudden miserable pain surprised thee, dim thine eyes, and dizzy swum in darkness, while thy head flames thick and fast drew forth, till on the left side, opening wide, likest thee in shape and countenance bright, then shining heavenly fair, a goddess armed out of thy head I sprung. Amazement seized all the host of heaven, Back they recoiled, afraid at first, and called me sin, and for a sign portentous held me. But familiar grown I pleased, and with attractive graces won the most diverse, thee chiefly, who full oft thyself in me thy perfect image viewing becamest enamoured. And such joy thou took'st with me in secret, that my womb conceived a growing burden. Meanwhile war arose, and fields were fought in heaven, wherein remained, for what could else, to our almighty foe clear victory, to our part loss and rout through all the Empyrean, down they fell, driven headlong from the pitch of heaven, down into this deep, and in the general fall I also, at which time this powerful key into my hand was given, with charge to keep these gates for ever shut, which none can pass without my opening. Pensive, here I sat alone, but long I sat not, till my womb, pregnant by thee, and now excessive groan, prodigious motion felt, and rueful throes. At last, this odious offspring whom thou seest, thine own begotten, breaking violent way, tore through my entrails, that with fear and pain distorted, all my nether shape thus grew transformed. But he, my inbred enemy, 
forth issued, brandishing his fatal dart, made to destroy. I fled, and cried out death. Hell trembled at the hideous name, and sighed from all her caves, and back resounded death. I fled, but he pursued, though more it seems inflamed with lust than rage, and swift afar me overtook his mother all dismayed, and in embraces forcible and foul engendering with me, of that rape begot these yelling monsters, that with ceaseless cry surround me, as thou sawest hourly conceived and hourly born, with sorrow infinite to me, for when they list into the womb that bred them they return, and howl and gnaw my bowels their repast, then bursting forth, afresh with conscious terrors vex me round, that rest or intermission none I find. Before mine eyes in opposition sits grim death, my son and foe, who sets them on, and me his parent would full soon devour for want of other prey, but that he knows his end with mine involved, and knows that I should prove a bitter morsel, and his bane, whenever that shall be, so fate pronounced. But thou, O father, I forewarn thee, shun his deadly arrow, neither vainly hope to be invulnerable in those bright arms, though tempered heavenly, for that mortal dint, save he who reigns above, none can resist. She finished, and the subtle fiend his law soon learned, now milder, and thus answered smooth, Dear daughter, since thou claimst me for thy sire, and my fair son here show'st me the dear pledge of deliance had with thee in heaven, and joys then sweet, now sad to mention, through dire change befallen us unforeseen, unthought of, know I come no enemy, but to set free from out this dark and dismal house of pain, both him and thee and all the heavenly host of spirits, that in our just pretences armed, fell with us from on high. From them I go this uncouth errand soul, and one for all myself expose, with lonely steps to tread the unfounded deep, and through the void immense, to search, with wandering quest, a place foretold should be, and by concurring signs, ere now created vast and round, a place of bliss, in the polios of heaven, and therein placed a race of upstart creatures, to supply perhaps our vacant room, though more removed, lest heaven, surcharged with potent multitude, might hap to move new broils. Be this or out, then this more secret now designed, I haste to know, and this once known shall soon return, and bring ye to the place where thou and death shall dwell at ease, and up and down unseen wing silently the buxom air, embalmed with odours. There ye shall be fed, and filled immeasurably, all things shall be your prey. He ceased, for both seemed highly pleased, and death grinned horrible a ghastly smile, to hear his famine should be filled, and blessed his more destined to that good hour, no less rejoiced his mother bad, and thus bespake her sire. The key of this infernal pit, by due, and by command of heaven's all-powerful king, I keep, by him forbidden to unlock these adamantine gates, against all force death ready stands to interpose his dart, fearless to be o'ermatched by living might. But what owe I to his commands above, who hates me, and hath hither thrust me down into this gloom of Tartarus profound, to sit in hateful office here confined, inhabitant of heaven, and heavenly born, here, in perpetual agony and pain? with terrors and with clamours compassed round of mine own brood, that on my bowels feed. Thou art my father, thou my author, thou my being gavest me. Whom should I obey but thee, whom follow? Thou wilt bring me soon to that new world of light and bliss, among the gods who live at ease, where I shall reign at thy right hand voluptuous, as beseems thy daughter and thy darling, without end. Thus saying, from her side the fatal key, sad instrument of all our woe, she took, and towards the gate ruling her bestial train. Forthwith the huge poor Cullis high up drew, which but herself not all the Stygian powers could once have moved. Then in the keyhole turns the intricate wards, and every bolt and bar of massy iron or solid rock with ease unfastens. On a sudden, open fly, with impetuous recoil and jarring sound, the infernal doors, and on their hinges great harsh thunder, that the lowest bottom shook of Erebus. She opened, 
but to shut excelled her power. The gates wide open stood, that with extended wings a bannered host, under spread ensigns marching might pass through, with horse and chariots ranked in loose array. So wide they stood, and like a furnace-mouth cast forth redounding smoke and ruddy flame. Before their eyes in sudden view appear the secrets of the hoary deep, a dark, illimitable ocean without bound, without dimension, where length, breadth, and height, and time and place are lost, where eldest night and chaos, ancestors of nature, hold eternal anarchy, amidst the noise of endless wars, and by confusion stand. For hot, cold, moist, and dry, four champions fierce strive here for mastery, and to battle bring their embryon atoms. They around the flag of each his faction, in their several clans, light-armed or heavy, sharp, smooth, swift or slow, swarm populous, unnumbered as the sands of Barca or Cyrene's torrid soil, levied to side with warring winds, and poise their lighter wings. To whom these most adhere, he rules a moment. Chaos, umpire, sits, and by decision more embroils the fray by which he reigns. Next him high arbiter chance governs all. Into this wild abyss, the womb of nature, and perhaps her grave, of neither sea, nor shore, nor air, nor fire, but all these, in their pregnant causes mixed confusedly, and which thus must ever fight, unless the Almighty Maker them ordain, his dark materials to create more worlds. Into this wild abyss the wary fiend stood on the brink of hell and looked a while, pondering his voyage, for no narrow frith he had to cross. Nor was his ear less pealed with noises loud and ruinous, to compare great things with small, than when Bologna storms, with all her battering engines bent to raise some capital city, or less than if this frame of heaven were falling, and these elements in mutiny had from her axle torn the steadfast earth. At last his sailboard veins he spreads for flight, and in the surging smoke uplifted spurns the ground, thence many a league, as in a cloudy chair ascending rides audacious. But that seat, soon failing, meets a vast vacuity. All unawares, fluttering his pennons, vain, plumb down he drops, ten thousand fadden deep, and to this hour down had been falling, had not, by ill chance, the strong rebuff of some tumultuous cloud, instinct with fire and nitre, hurried him as many miles aloft, that fury stayed quenched in a boggy surtis, neither sea nor good dry land, nigh founded on he fares, treading the crude consistence, half on foot, half flying, behoves him now both oar and sail. As when a griffin through the wilderness with winged course o'er hill or moory dale, pursues the Arimaspian, who by stealth had, from his wakeful custody, purloined the guarded gold. So eagerly the fiend, o'er bog or steep, through strait, rough, dense, or rare, with head, hands, wings, or feet, pursues his way, and swims, or sinks, or wades, or creeps, or flies. At length, a universal hubbub wild, of stunning sounds and voices all confused, borne through the hollow dark, assaults his ear with loudest vehemence. Thither he plies, undaunted to meet there whatever power, or spirit of the nethermost abyss, might in that noise reside, of whom to ask which way the nearest coast of darkness lies bordering on light, when straight behold the throne of chaos, and his dark pavilion spread wide on a wasteful deep. With him enthroned sat sable-vested knight, eldest of things, the consort of his reign. And by them stood Orcus and Aides, and the dreaded name of Demogorgon, rumour next, and chance, and tumult, and confusion all embroiled, and discord with a thousand various mouths. To whom Satan, turning boldly, thus, Ye powers and spirits of this nethermost abyss, chaos and ancient night, I come no spy, with purpose to explore, or to disturb the secrets of your realm, but by constraint wandering this darksome desert, as my way lies through your spacious empire up to light, alone, and without guide, half lost, I seek what readiest path leads where your gloomy bounds confine with heaven, 
or if some other place from your dominion won, the ethereal king possesses lately, thither to arrive I travel this profound, direct my course. Directed, no mean recompense it brings to your behoof, if I, that region lost, all usurpation thus expelled, reduce to her original darkness and your sway, which is my present journey, and once more erect the standard there of ancient night. Yours be the advantage all, mine the revenge. Thus Satan, and him thus the Anak old, with faltering speech and visage incomposed, answered, I know thee, stranger, who thou art, that mighty leading angel, who of late made head against heaven's king, though overthrown. I saw, and heard, for such a numerous host fled not in silence through the frighted deep, with ruin upon ruin, rout on rout, confusion worse confounded, and heaven gates poured out by millions her victorious bands pursuing. I upon my frontiers here keep residence, if all I can will serve, that little which is left so to defend, encroached on still through our intestine broils, weakening the sceptre of old night, first hell, your dungeon stretching far and wide beneath, now lately heaven and earth another world hung o'er my realm, linked in a golden chain, to that side heaven from whence your legions fell, if that way be your walk, you have not far, so much the nearer danger. Go and speed. Havoc and spoil and ruin are my gain. He ceased, and Satan stayed not to reply, but glad now that his sea should find a shore, with fresh alacrity and force renewed, springs upward like a pyramid of fire into the wild expanse, and through the shock of fighting elements, on all sides round environed wins his way harder beset and more endangered than when Argo passed through Bosphorus, betwixt the jostling rocks, or when Ulysses on the larboard shunned Charybdis, and by the other whirlpool steered. So he, with difficulty and labour hard, moved on. With difficulty and labour he, but he once passed, soon after when man fell, strange alteration. Sin and death amain following his track, such was the will of heaven paved after him a broad and beaten way, over the dark abyss, whose boiling gulf tamely endured a bridge of wondrous length, from hell continued, reaching that most orb of this frail world, by which the spirits perverse, with easy intercourse, pass to and fro to tempt or punish mortals, except whom God and good angels guard by special grace. But now at last the sacred influence of light appears and from the walls of heaven shoots far into the bosom of dim night a glimmering dawn. Here nature first begins her farthest verge, and chaos to retire, as from her outmost works a broken foe, with tumult less, and with less hostile din. That Satan, with less toil, and now with ease, wafts on the calmer wave by dubious light, and like a weather-beaten vessel holds gladly the port, though shrouds and tackle torn or in the emptier waste, resembling air, weighs his spread wings, at leisure to behold far off the imperial heaven, extended wide in circuit, undetermined square or round, with opal towers and battlements adorned of living sapphire, once his native seat. And fast by hanging in a golden chain, this pendant world, in bigness as a star of smallest magnitude close by the moon, Thither, full fraught with mischievous revenge, accursed, and in a cursed hour he hies. The End of the Second Part of the Second Book